How many of you feel that way tonight? How many of you feel that Jesus is your everything? How many, let me ask you a question before we go to the Lord in prayer and before we go to the Lord for this uh, study tonight and this, this message tonight. How many of you believe we're in the last days? Yes, sir. I mean, come on, you've heard that for years and years and years. How many of you actually believe we're in the last days? Well, tonight we're going to tell you a little bit about that. So I'm going to ask you as you're standing, if you would grab your Bibles, and if not, just look up on the screens. I'm going to show you a little bit tonight from the book of Revelation. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And uh, So as we go, as we turn there, turn to Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to go to verses 10 through 14. Let me read those for you right off the bat as we start this mor- to tonight, and so you can see it. The Bible says this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. John the Revelator is talking from the island of Patmos, 96 AD. He's an old disciple right now. And he says this, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And it says this, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book. Send it unto the seven churches which are Asia, in Asia, unto Ephesus, that's by the way today Turkey, unto Ephesus and Smyrna, unto Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about his paps, that's his, that's his midsection with a golden girdle. His head were, and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Look at this picture, because that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about tonight the resplendent Christ. The next time we see Christ, we shall see him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for this great church, Lord God. I thank you for this pastor, Lord God, who's pouring everything he has in it, Lord, and I thank you for the future of what's going to happen, Lord, right here. I pray tonight, Lord God, that every single one of us would absorb what you want to tell us. Let us assimilate it. Let us eat it up, Lord God. Let it go into us, Lord God, and change us. Lord, instead of just a worldview, I pray that we have an eternal view tonight, Lord, so that we truly are revived, knowing that you are coming back for your bride. Bless us tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I've taught Revelation for probably 30-some years, and I've uh, actually written a couple of books on it, written a couple of uh, manuals to study it, and tonight I'm not going to teach you Revelation. I've done a lot of things in teaching it. I've done a little rhyme, that, and I've actually painted pictures for every chapter. I'll give you a little bit of the rhyme. Revelation chapter 1, we shall see the sun. Revelation chapter 2, work of churches to do. Revelation chapter 3, where will our church be? Revelation chapter 4, anybody know what chapter 4 is? An open door. Revelation chapter 5, wounded lamb alive. Revelation chapter 6, four horsemen, fire and brimstone mix. Chapter 7, two multitudes taken to heaven. Chapter 8, a third of life affected by wormwood's fate. Chapter 9, an open pit, Euphrates, angels in mind. Chapter 10, land and seal become a god again. Gods again. And I keep going on all the way to the end of Revelation. I also teach some Bible studies, and before those Bible studies in Birmingham on Wednesday night and Thursday night, I talk about in the news. I give the prophecy of what's happening in the news, because how many of you know that the media in America is not giving you that? They really aren't. You've heard me tell you what I feel about the media last time I was here. I told you the acronyms of what I, what I, how, what I call the media, uh, especially CNN, which is certainly not newsworthy. And so I want to let you know that the news is happening very, very quick. I used to look for things for prophecy for uh, probably a week to try to find something 20, 15, 20 years ago. Now I have to call so many different headlines, it's not even funny. What's happening in our world is truly scary. What is happening in our world, uh, as we see in Syria, is something that most Americans aren't even being fed. There is a quagmire, there is a mud puddle in, in Syria that's about to blow up. Bashar al-Assad is not a, uh, he's not a Shiite Muslim, he's not a, he's not an, al- he's an Alawite. He's not a Shia, he's not any type of Muslim other than an ally. Very small minority. He's hated by almost everyone. He's killing his people in mass. Russia is aligned with him, and we are against Bashar al-Assad. We know that Hezbollah is aligned with him. We know that we are aligned with the Kurds, who the Russians are fighting. Man, you can get twisted really quick. Something's going to happen in Syria. It's going to blow the lid off of everything. Coupled with that, we have Turkey that's aligning with Russia. Turkey is the the. Uh, pr- the president of Turkey is Erdogan, and it's the first time in history that Turkey has aligned with Russia. Now, if you know anything about your Bible and anything about prophecy, Russia is Gog, its leader is Magog. Turkey is, to, is, is Togarmar, and they're, they're lining up together. We know that they're going to do some type of preemptive strike to Israel sooner or later. Psalm 83 tells us that. Then you have, the, you have China building its nuclear power and its muscles, and you have, of course, the rogue nation of North Korea. But Russia, just this last week, uh, gave a communique 
today, Putin gave a communique that he has a, he has a sign widening intercontinental ballistic missile and he's threatening the United States. He's already doing it. We know that things are happening economically. We see, I've told you this before, we see a cashless society coming. We see a lot of things coming down the line. Let me give you a little, a little bit more about this. There is something happening in Israel that's absolutely phenomenal. We are watching the embassy being moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, let me tell you, and I don't want to be political with you today, but let me tell you a little bit about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not our savior. He's someone God is using, though. You need to understand that. Christians try to make him, he's not our savior. Jesus is our savior. But, but, God is using him in an amazing way. And if he does nothing else other than moving the embassy to Jerusalem, he's going to bring a blessing on America. And I'm going to tell you that something in May, they just announced it last week, in May, we're going to have an ambassador out of Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem, and we're going to take over a temporary spot for our embassy. We are moving it in May. And I want you to understand that that is a phenomenal, so phenomenal that uh, we have the Sanhedrin that has come together again, uh, the ancient Nasan Sanhedrin, that was, the, that was the actual body, 120 Jewish rabbis that actually have a, le have a leadership uh, role in Israel. Uh, the Knesset listens to them, they have, a, they have a representative in the Knesset. They came together for the first time in 2,000 years, three years ago. And now they made a, they're printing up a coin, and I suggest you go online and see it. The coin has Cyrus the Great, who was the first one to let the, let the Israelites go out of Babylon to build their second temple. And next to Cyrus the Great, they have Donald Trump. <laughs> let me tell you what this, what this coin's gonna be used for, silver coin, because they feel, and I'm, I 100% agree with them, that God is using Donald Trump as a Cyrus the Great to rebuild the third temple. All the money for the sales of that, of that coin is going to be building the third temple. The third temple, we know that if somebody said to me, well, I don't want to pay, pay for that, that coin because Antichrist is going to come into that temple and we're going to have animal sacrifices. That's only a very temporary time. Jesus is going to rule and reign from that temple for 1,000 years. Jesus is coming back. Yes, he is. Now, I want you to understand a couple things tonight because I don't know if we understand who's coming back. I don't know if we understand who this Jesus is. And so tonight I want to bring you to the, to the level of knowing that. According to a May 16, 2017 Newsweek poll, American opinions on the book of Revelation and the end times says this. The numbers are all over the board. 64% of Americans believe Satan exists and 93% of evangelicals, us, believe he exists. I wonder what those other 7% believe in. 55% of Americans believe in the rapture of, and the faithful will be taken to heaven. 55% of Americans. That's over half of Americans believe that. 36% of Americans believe, in, uh, believe that the uh, book of Revelation contains pure and true prophecy. While 47% of it say it's purely metaphorical and it's a fable that, that gives out some type of general truth. And only 17% of those polled believe that the world will end in their lifetimes. What all the mumbo jumbo inconsistency of the numbers is telling us is that a great majority of Americans have their own kind of belief system. It's, a, it's made up. It's not necessarily what the Bible says, but rather what they want or choose to believe. We're in a society right now where Americans used to have some doctrines. They used to believe in certain things based on scripture. Now it's a Burger King Christianity. You take this and you believe it, you take that and you believe it, you take that, so you have people spattered all over the world. But let me tell you something, the Bible is still the word of God, it is still the truth of God, and it is still our authoritative rule of faith and conduct. Many, many people, Christians and non-Christians alike, say they find the book of Revelation uncomfortable. Uh, they find much of the imagery disturbing, and they're put off by the concept of God's judgment on the world. People just don't want to hear that word anymore, judgment. Yet millions of people have flocked to the cinema to see the film The Lord of the Rings in which the state-of-the-art special effects are used to bring to life J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, Middle Earth. Many of the images of the film are also quite frightening, but that doesn't seem to put people off by watching them. Indeed, much of the message of both the books are the same, of an ongoing war between the forces of good and evil. And in both cases, evil is ultimately defeated, thank God, and destroyed while the forces of good prevail. The difference, of course, is that the Lord of the Rings is fiction, and will never come true. While the real disturbing thought for people about the book of Revelation is that some people like you and I believe it will actually happen. And let me tell you something, I believe as much as I'm standing here today that everything in the, in the Bible, everything in the book, everything in Revelation will come to pass. And I want you to understand that's what we're doing. So I'm here to tell you that the apocalypse is the unveiling of Jesus will happen. 
That word apocalypse is the Greek word for revelation. And if I took a statue and I put it here, and you've seen this done, I'd put a, I, before I unveiled it to the world, I'd put a black, a black uh, cloth over it. And then when I take that off, in the Greek, that's called apocalypsis. I'm revealing it. This is what Revelation does. It's revealing the final plan of God for mankind. The final plan of what God, what God started in the Garden of Eden, which we'll get to in a moment. Just as he said it would happen. The Revelation is one sermon. It's given by Jesus to just one man, John, about the one living hope to pass along to the living. And Jesus isn't going to preach a living sermon to a dead person. Even though there are lots of dead preachers preaching a lot of dead sermons to a bunch of dead people in thousands of dead churches today. I was traveling years ago, I was traveling down to get to our church and Sunday morning real early. And my wife was in the car next to me and we got to a stoplight right about, about two blocks away from my church. And I looked over and there was a couple there in a car. He was plastered as much as he possibly could to the driver's side. Looked like he was going to get out the window. They were all dressed up, looked nice. They, the, the lady, the woman was on the other side. They couldn't be further away in that front seat. And they had those looks on their faces like, do you remember the Wheaties commercials? They looked so miserable. I said, Cheryl, pray, pray real hard. She said, what do you, and she saw me, she said, what are we praying for? I said, pray they don't come to our church. <laughs> Misery is contagious. It really is. Get away from people that are miserable. Oh, pastor, you're telling us to stay away? You need people to encourage you. You need people to build you up. You need people to light your fire. You need people to get you going. Now, this message of this account, this Jesus we preach is alive, and he's coming back for the living even the dead who knew him will jump back to life at his appearing. I go to Israel. Your pastor has told you that many, many times. I guide there. And I, I love the one view when we get onto the Mount of Olives and we overlook the Kidron Valley. Matter of fact, there's three valleys that separate Mount Zion, the Zion Hill. Those three valleys are what's called a shin. They make a shin. It's a, it's a letter in the Greek alphabet, and it means blessing. God put, Israel, God put Zion right in the middle of three valleys. The Kidron Valley, the Valley of the Teropian Valley, which is the Valley of the Cheesemakers, and then the Gehenna Valley that's right in the the middle. Zion's right in the middle of it. Well, I'll stand on the Mount of Olives, and when you look down the Mount of Olives to the eastern gate, it's closed. It's sealed up. That's the gate that Jesus went through on Palm Sunday. It's been sealed for thousands of years. The Jews believe their Messiah is going to come back through that gate. And so they started burying all their people right across from that gate, believing that the, re that the, that the resurrection of the dead is going to happen when their Messiah comes back. Well, the Muslims knew that the Jews believed that, and they know that a Messiah would have to be a type of rabbi, so they start burying their dead right in front of the gate because they believe that, uh, that they can't touch a dead thing. So how many of you know Jesus doesn't have to come and touch any kind of earth to get through that gate? And then Christians, thousands and thousands, and when you look down, there's graves everywhere. And the thing that hits me when I stand there is the Jews bury their, bury their dead with their feet facing the temple so that when the Messiah comes, all they'll do is come up out of the grave and take one step towards the temple. I am telling you, there's coming a resurrection of the dead. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then there's who are alive and remain will be caught up so forever to be with the Lord in the air. We know that's about to happen. It's the next imminent thing on God's calendar. There's nothing else that has to happen. It could happen right now, tonight. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm not interested in debating anyone. I'm telling you that you are the bride of Christ and God wants to pull you out before wrath comes. If you look at scripture, you will never find the church mentioned after chapter 4. After chapter 4, it's all about Israel because Jesus is married to the church. You are the bride of Christ. But Israel is the wife of Jehovah. He made promises to them. And so in Revelation, they're going to have an opportunity to go back to him. We know there's going to be a revival. 144,000 are going to stand on, on Mount Zion. They are not Jehovah Witnesses. They're male virgin Jews of Israel that will cause a massive revival. We know that seven-year tribulation will come. I don't have time to go over that whole tribulation with you tonight. But the revelation is that one sermon. There's lots of people that don't understand it. No, this message, this account, this Jesus we preach, he's alive and he's coming back for us. So I'm preaching a, so I'm not preaching a dead message today or any other day. And I know I'm not preaching to a dead church. You are the living. You are the living sons and daughters of God. You are the, you are the righteous of God. We need to understand who we are in God. He's coming back for you. There is a kingdom inside you. The kingdom of God is inside you. All we need now is the king to return and set up his kingdom. This book is alive. This word is powerful. The truths are undeniable. And you are the living, the ones the revelation is meant for. It is not a guide 
For the, those left, it's a glimpse for the blessed. Most people take Revelation thinking, well, this is a guide for everybody else. No, it's not about the people who are left. This book is for those of us who are blessed. It's given to us. You are not a Newsweek statistic tonight. You are a news-breaking saint. It's called the Revelation, not because it's a new truth. If the truth be known, the truth found in Revelations are not new. There is no such thing as a new truth. There is no such thing as a new truth. If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. There is such a thing as a freshly discovered truth, or a freshly applied truth, or a freshly revealed truth, but there's no such thing as a new truth. That's why we receive truth by revelation. Revelation implies, by its very nature, seeing something that's already there. I told you. The statue's already there. You're revealing it. It's not a new truth. It's already there. What God is doing is taking the veil away for us and showing us what's about to happen. That is a, not a new truth. He always had that there, but he's just letting us see it. Listen, Muhammad did not receive new truth way back in 622 AD on the Arabian Peninsula. It was, no, it was the old lie that he told in a new way. Buddha didn't receive new truth way back in 530 BC in, the northern, in northern India. No, it was the old lie that he told wrapped in humanistic form. And Confucius, Kung Fu Se is his name, a Chinese name, didn't receive new truth way back in 520 BC, living in the modern uh, Shangtung Providence. No, it was an old lie that was looking for ethics and morals. Are you ready for this? So you can help elect the right political rulers. Man, we need that in Washington. That's all it was. No, tonight I give you no new truth. Just revelation, revealing of something that's already there. Before I begin, let me reiterate what I've preached and said that hundreds of times. Revelation brings us full circle to the complete plan of God for all the ages. See, when God made Adam and Eve, he had a plan. God's plan was not flawed. Man became flawed, but God's plan was not flawed. He didn't make a mistake. God's desire for man is for him to live on planet Earth and to have a fellowship with him. God's desire for plan was never, God's plan for man was never for them to go to heaven. You read, you read Genesis. It was also never for him to go to hell. It was for him to live in harmony with God, to repopulate the earth. Then what would have happened, Pastor Mark? Well, look at everything he's created. Look at everything he's created. What do you think would happen when man repopulates the earth? God's going to allow, allow man to go to other planets. I know that sounds science fiction, but trust me, God made them there for a reason. Now, we're on the very beginning, if I could tell you this. We're on the very beginning. We think so much time has passed by. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years, but a day. We're on the very beginning of God's plan. Satan came in and marred it through sin, and God sent his son to make us born again, again, born again so that we could become what? The chosen priests and the chosen kings to rule and reign with him. What do you think you're going to rule with? Who do you think you're going to rule over? How many of you ever read in scripture that you're supposed to rule and reign with Christ? Join heirs, ruling and reign. Raise your hand because it's in there. There you go. So we're going to rule and reign with Christ. Who do you think you're going to rule over? I'm not going to rule over you. And I'm not going to rule over you. You're not going to rule over me. So who are we going to rule over? Can I blow your minds for a little bit? How about the people born during the millennium? They're going to be mortals. You will be immortal. They will be mortals born. Now, I know that's going to mess you up a little bit because we don't go that far. But trust me, when you rule and reign, you've got to rule and reign over someone. And you are a joint heir just like I am. I'm not going to rule over you and you're not going to rule over me. How many are still with me tonight? Just a little bit. All right. So Revelation chapter 21 and 22 read just like Genesis chapter 2. It's the complete circle. You can see the, the entire circle, the scheme of God. Genesis speaks of a creation of the sun. Revelation tells us that there's no need for the sun. Genesis speaks of the entrance of sin into the world. Revelation tells us of the banishment of sin. Genesis speaks of sin curse that is pronounced upon mankind. Revelation tells us the, bro the curse is broken. Genesis tells us of everything, everything getting degraded. Revelation tells us that everything will be new. Listen, Genesis speaks of Satan's first triumphant victory over mankind. Revelation speaks of Satan's ultimate demise. Finally, Genesis speaks of the exclusion of the tree of life. Revelation speaks of the omission of the tree of life. And a matter of fact, if you read Revelation chapter 21 and 22, you'll find that there's a river there, just like the river that was in Eden. And you'll find that there's a tree there, the tree of life, and it has 12 manner of fruit for the healing of the nations. Let me tell you something. When you're raptured, you're not going to be healed. You're not going to need to be healed anymore. You're never going to taste of that fruit. That's for the people that are born. That's for the ones that you and I are going to rule and reign over. No, we're in the beginning of this. God is pulling out a chosen people, a royal priesthood that they would be able to rule and reign with him. You are God's plan A. He's pulling you out. You are, that's why the enemy is at you every single day. That's why he wants to get you every time he, you turn around because he knows your destiny. So I think it's really sad 
that you don't have you don't have churches that talk about your ultimate destiny. I think it's real sad when you don't when you don't when you have pastors that will not invite somebody like myself to tell those things. I think it's sad when people think all God is is a cosmic Santa Claus to get him from point A to point B. God's not just somebody to give us things. He's giving you his creation. There's a time where you're going to rule and reign with Jesus as a joint heir. Think about that. It should blow your mind. You're with me tonight, right? But why? Why should we read this book? So tonight, we get a glimpse of the glorified Christ. Why? Because you will instantly receive a blessing just by reading this book tonight. And just by hearing it. It's one of the only books. It is the only book in the Bible that gives you a blessing just by hearing it. Twice. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The imminency. Now to you and I, it maybe sound like it's 2,000 years, but it's a blink of an eye for God. It's a blink of an eye. Let me tell you something. John wrote it just like it was going to happen tomorrow. And so there's a blessing. If you're just here tonight, you're going to get a blessing. Expect it tomorrow. Expect it this week. Expect the fact that God says, I will bless those who read this book. Secondly, second reason I'm preaching it tonight is because of my vision for the church in America. My vision for the church in America is to increase and encourage it. And to encourage you in the development of intimacy with Christ. We need intimacy. Intimacy is important. Let me tell you why. Because with intimacy comes accountability. I have intimacy with my wife. She's made me the most accountable man on the planet. When I first got saved, of course, I came from a long line of womanizers. When I first got saved, we, and, I, and I got married to Cheryl very soon after that, we walked down the street, and I'd see some, a pretty lady, and I'd, I'd look at her more than I should look at her. Cheryl would say, what are you doing? Don't tell me you haven't done that. <laughs> Be real with me. She made me accountable. She, she, intimacy brings accountability, or at least it should. It brings accountability. Accountability brings reliability. Now she doesn't have to say that because she understands she trusts me. Well, I've been accountable. I've been, she, we've been intimate and accountable with each other. And reliability brings availability. You want to do something for someone. So let me just repeat that for you. Intimacy, with intimacy comes accountability. With accountability comes reliability. With reliability comes availability. When you know Jesus more intimately, you will be more accountable to him. And you will be more reliable on him, which will make you more available for him. The reason there's a lot of people in churches that don't work in the church, that don't help the church out, is because they may not have an intimacy with that church. They may not have an intimacy even with God. There's a lot of people who pass through our doors, and they just pass through. Come on, someone say amen. When you know Jesus. So let's take a glimpse of the glorified Christ tonight. In Revelation chapter 1, we see a whole new Jesus than the one revealed to us in the Gospels. Remember, this was always part of Jesus' nature, yet not revealed before. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, listen to what it says. It's a prophecy of the coming Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And this is the same sentence, notice the semicolon on the end, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, later on when you go home tonight, you want to read Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It's an account when Jesus goes to the Capernaum synagogue, and they bring him up to read the book, read the scroll. He comes up and he reads this verse, but you know what he does? He stops at the semicolon. He never says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all. He never says that. It says he, clo- he stops there and he closes the book. Why is that? Because there's two Messiahs that were prophesied in the Old Testament. There is the suffering Messiah, and then there's a conquering Messiah. The suffering Messiah is the one that come to die for us. The conquering Messiah is the one that puts down sin once and for all. The reason the Pharisees missed Jesus is they were expecting a conquering Messiah. They were expecting somebody to come and throw off the yoke of Rome. They were expecting something. That's why Judas Iscariot joined the 12 of the 12. It's why he was so excited about Christ because he thought he was the one to overthrow Rome. When he didn't do that, that's why Jesus, that's why Judas sold him out. You have a suffering Messiah and a conquering Messiah. All through Isaiah, you'll find a tree with two branches. You'll see him prophesying of the suffering Messiah. You'll see him prophesying of the conquering Messiah. And people got confused all the way down the line. They were, they were looking for a suffering Messiah or a conquering Messiah instead of a suffering Messiah. Let me just remember, remind you, you can forget the meek, lowly image of a suffering Messiah returning. You can forget the image of someone who was on a cross crucified retire, re- returning. That's not the Christ that's coming back. Jesus did that to buy us back from Satan's grasp. The next time you see him, he's going to look like this. The next time you see him, he's not going to look like the lowly 
holy Nazarene. He's not going to be on some little donkey. He's going to be on a white horse. The next time you see him, he's going to be victor over death, hell, and the grave. The next time you see him, he's going to have a tattoo emblazoned on his, on his leg. He's going to have a vesture. His eyes are going to be like fire. There's going to be a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. His hair is going to be white as wool. He's coming as the victory, victor of planet Earth. He's coming to reclaim it all. He is our Lord and Savior. He is the one that's going to take it all back. I want you to understand, Jesus died to take us out of Satan's grasp, but the next time, my, the next time, you see, the devil was conquered by his own trophy of victory. He thought he killed Christ. He thought he won. He was conquered by his own trophy of victory. We know that. The devil jumped for joy when he seduced the first man, Adam. He must have thought he had it made. He messed up God's plan. And he cast, down, cast Adam down to, de- to die, to death. The wages of sin is death. By seducing Adam, he did that, the first man. He slew him through death, so to speak. But by slaying the last man, Jesus, he lost the first man from his snare. Let me just explain it. As soon as Jesus died, Adam was released from hell's grasp. You can't get to heaven. This mortal body cannot inherit immortality. You have to have innocent blood put on you. All of the righteous that died before Christ, all of the righteous went to a place called Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was a part of what we know of Sheol. If you imagine one side here and another side here in a great gulf, Jesus told us about the, the rich man and Lazarus with the water, that great gulf, this side of Sheol we now know as hell. This side was Abraham's bosom. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. They died in righteousness. They were waiting for him to come. The Bible says that after Jesus resurrected, after he went to hell, he led captivity captive, the Bible says. He went to hell. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from the enemy. He's the only one ever to jump that gap. And then he preached captivity. To, he preached himself to the captives. The Bible says in John that at the resurrection, many of the saints who had died were seen walking around Jerusalem. It was a limited resurrection. I'm telling you, Jesus is the victor. And I want you to understand he's ready to come back. As soon as Jesus died, Adam was released from hell's grasp. All he had to do was confess and believe. And that happened when Jesus descended into hell, when he led captivity captive. Oh, come on. Then he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. Now watch, catch up, because Revelation tells us what he'll do next. That's the last thing he did. Revelation is going to tell us exactly what he's going to do next. The Bible says this, and before I get there, let me show it to you. He has hair and head white as wool. His face is shining like the sun, eyes like a flame of fire, a sword coming out of his mouth. He holds seven stars in his hand and a golden sash around his his chest. He's clothed down to his feet and he has feet like burning brass. Really listen to it because I'm going to take three of those tonight and tell you about Jesus coming back. And so with this resplendent view of Christ tells us what's happening. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 5 verse 5, it says this, do, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. The lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. The lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. I want you to understand it. In Revelation we see the lamb become the lion. We see an oxymoron. We see the two opposites. That's the double nature. Jesus came as an innocent lamb. He came to die for our sins innocently. He never put up a struggle. But next time he comes back, it's no small lamb he's coming as. He's coming as a lion. The king of the jungle. The one that can hunt down and take down anyone. That's the new Jesus that you're going to see. It's an oxymoron. I'm sure you know what those are. They're figures of speech that seem to contradict themselves. There's lists and lists of things that are are some of my favorites. Artificial grass. Boneless ribs. How do you have a rib that's a boneless? Big town. Oxymoron. Fresh frozen. I like this one. Jumbo shrimp. This one may be an oxymoron. Cafeteria food. At least it was for me growing up. How about easy labor? How about military intelligence? One choice. If you have a choice, it's more than one. Or government organization. That's definitely an oxymoron. The living dead. Same difference. Plastic glasses. How about peace force? I like this one. How about pretty ugly? It's an oxymoron. (laughs) Chapter 5 of the book of Revelation gives us another oxymoron. Something that sounds impossible. A lion and a lamb. The lion would usually devour the lamb. The lamb would usually run away. I want to go back to that one. So basically, we're giving this oxymoron. This is what I want you to know about. Listen, the devil jumped for joy when Christ died. 
by the very death of Christ, the devil was overcome. He took, the, as it were, the bait in the mousetrap. Follow it. He rejoiced at the death, thinking himself death's commander. But that which caused his joy dangled the bait before him. The Lord's cross was the devil's mousetrap. Let me repeat it. The Lord's cross was the devil's mousetrap. The bait which caught him was the death of the Lord. When Jesus died, he caught Satan because he had to die to defeat him. And he caught him in his own trap. Today, Satan's neck is caught in his own trap because Christ died and resurrected. You know, the movie world seems to be obsessed with the end of the world. There have been a steady stream of films coming out of Hollywood that talk about the last days around the theme of the end time events and the takeoffs on the book of Revelation. Films like The End of Days, films like The Armageddon, they're old, but they became deep impact or Independence Day are just a few. So I did a little list and I, find out, I wanted to find out how obsessed is secular man with these last days scenarios. Well, prior to 1950, there were four films from Hollywood that talked about the last days or the end times. From 1950 to 1960, 13. From 1961 to 1970, 24. From 1971 to 1980, 35. From 1981 to 1990, 47. From 1991 to 2050. From 2001 to today, 350. Everyone knows it's coming. Everyone understands what's going on. Matter of fact, you've seen some of them. Some of the ones that have come is the world's end. It wasn't very popular, but it was about the end of the world. And everybody saw this one, the book of Eli. And believe it or not, even the Marvel comics got in on it. Thor and Ragnar Ragnarok is about the last times, the end times of humanity. There is more and more films. I remember when I was a kid, there was a trilogy of films coming out called The Omen. They've been redoing those. How many remember that, The Omen? How many do you not remember The Omen trilogies? That's because you're puppies. Okay, so I remember them coming up, and I remember them coming out. The parents suspected that their little child was demonic. And they were shocked when they pulled back his hair and saw a 666 under his scalp. I mean, come on, go figure. And they watched him. They watched him grow up. Those, the 662 tattooed on his forehead. The second film, Damien, Omen 2, showed him as a teenager and what happened when his identity was revealed to him by satanic agents. Uh, I haven't seen the movies, but the reviews sound like they would send you to bed with nightmares waiting to happen. Herein is the greatest mistake we make in Revelation. Listen to me. It is the greatest mistake we make in interpreting Revelation. We make Revelation more about the Antichrist than we do about Jesus Christ. And I want you to know the Antichrist is a tiny player in Revelation. He appears only for, for three and a half years to seven years. He appears as friend to man for three and a half years, and then his demise comes at the seven years. But if you read all through Revelation, there's a thousand year millennium that's going to come. There's a thousand years where Jesus is going to rule and reign from planet Earth on the new and Jerusalem. I want you to understand it's not about the Antichrist. It's about Jesus Christ. So when you think of Jesus of Revelation, Concentrate on this word. It's the first thing I want to tell you tonight. Concentrate on the word penetrating. Revelation 1.14, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Concentrate on that word penetrating. His eyes were on a, as a flame of fire. It's figurative speech. Today you may say it this way. And his eyes had x-ray vision. Or you may say his eyes burned a hole right through me. A person pretends to be someone they're not, and someone comes along and says, they don't fool me. I can see right through them. It's a sober thought, the penetrating eyes of Jesus. Let me tell you something, I've preached in churches for, all, for most of my adult life, and as I preached many, many times to crowds, there were large crowds, people would come up to me afterward, and they say, Pastor Mark, you were preaching right at me. You were looking right at me. Or one guy came up to me and said, what am, why did my wife call you up and tell you all about me? All right. They think I'm preaching at them. You never stopped looking at me. They thought I was looking right at him <laughs> when in fact I wasn't <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about they said about Adolf Hitler by the way a diminutive guy five foot nine he talked about an Aryan race that had to be blonde blue eyed and six foot tall he was none of that <laughs> but they said his eyes were penetrating they were demonic he could, he could lull a congregation and a crowd of people, thousands, millions of them. You know the eyes of Christ. Hitler's eyes can't compare to the penetrating eyes of Christ. His eyes are piercing. Look, his eyes are as a flame of fire, penetrating. Pastor Mark, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to us? Listen, sometimes we can fool our boss. Sometimes we can fool our preacher. Sometimes we can fool our friends, our kids. Sometimes, not often, you can fool your wife. But the big newsflash of Revelation is that man cannot fool God. 
Hitler fooled an entire continent, all of Europe, until he destroyed it 10 years later. You can fool an awful lot of people, but you can't fool God. Osama bin Laden fooled America. He was hiding out in Pakistan, one of our allies. For years he was there. He fooled everyone. We didn't know where he was, but he didn't fool God. Listen, some crazed mass shooter in Florida can fool everybody and, and do a, a daring deed, but he cannot fool God. The eyes of God are penetrating. It's happened many times. I read a statistic that says one out of every two people, even with our forensic science, one out of every two people who commit murder in America get away with it. You may think they get away with it, but they don't get away with it with God. If O.J. Simpson thought he got away with it, he's got another thing coming when he stands before God. You will never fool God. You can fool everyone, because there, but there's another judge coming. It doesn't matter if a judge exonerates you. It doesn't matter if a judge wipes out your record. It doesn't matter. There's another judge coming. And if you have not confessed your sins, that judge will judge you in righteousness. He's coming back. Let me tell you a lame joke. My girls tell me that I tell lame jokes because I'm old. It's, it's part of growing old. You get to tell lame jokes. So here it is. This guy was not smart. He was on trial for stealing a watch. The prosecution presented their best case, not, and then there wasn't enough evidence. The judge said, Sam, you've been acquitted. Sam says, does that mean I have to give the watch back? I told you, it was a lame joke. I had to get it out of the way. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active. It's quick. Sharper than any double sharp edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. King James says, everything is naked and open to the God with whom we have to do. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we must give account. Everything. My secret thoughts, God knows. What I do in private, God knows. He knows, I'm not fooling anyone. If I'm trying to fool and get away with something, I'm not fooling anyone. God knows me. Now, let's turn that around a bit, and let's really kind of turn it to our, our favor. The word says that all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It also means Jesus sees right through your problems today. He sees right through your difficult decisions today, right through your hard choices. We talked about wildernesses this morning. He sees right through your wilderness. It's penetrating eyes aren't just to see all of our problems. Look what John says. John says this in John chapter 1, verse 47, 48. Jesus answered and said, he's talking to Nathan. I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then, oh, excuse me, Nathaniel. Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He said, I saw you, Nathaniel. Before you ever came to follow me, I saw you, Nathaniel. Think about what he's telling him. He says, I saw you sitting under the tree. Listen, before you ever came in here tonight, God knows what tree you've been sitting under. He knows if you've been sitting under a tree of faith and encouragement, or he knows if you've been sitting under a tree of doubt and discouragement. Yes, the guilty of this world who hide behind money and popularity and carnal lives will be exposed. You can't fool God. I wrote a poem for you. Can I tell you my poem I wrote for you? Just for you. You ready? Here it is. A man can fool the hapless public. He can be a secret fraud. He can hide his favorite sins, but he cannot fool God. A man can advertise as many virtues. He can self-achievement laud. He can pile himself up with riches, but he cannot fool God. A man can show off his many talents. He can hear all the world applaud. He can boast himself of being famous, but he cannot run from God. I'm telling you, you cannot fool God. That is a, that is a chilling thought, and it's a comforting thought. It means that God is there, and he sees everything you're going through. He sees what we hide, and he sees what we bring out and open. But I want you to understand it. When I think of Jesus, when I glimpse the glory of Christ, when I think about him coming back, I can't help but think of those flaming eyes of fire, penetrating the darkest, the most devilish plans of Satan that is devised against me and you. He sees through what we fear most. Oh, come on, there is nothing that misses his eternal gaze, including everything that's coming at you and me this week, everything that's coming at you and me this month. God sees everything. The word of God is so powerful. His name is mentioned 11,000 times in scripture. It is a book to reveal God. One of those names is El Olam. I love that name. El is a prefix for God. El Olam means the God out of the vanishing point. If you are an artist today, you'll understand what vanishing point is. You have a picture, you want to draw a train, and you want to draw the distance of a train. So you'll see it, you'll put a point out here, and over here you'll draw the engine, and you'll take those two lines, and they'll start to converge, and they'll bring you all the way back to here so you get the sense of distance. El Olam means that wherever you go in the past, God's there. Wherever you go in the future, God's there. He's in your tomorrow. He's in your next week. He's in your next month. You may be worried about what's going to happen, but God is already 
already there. He's already there. And let me tell you something, he's taking care of you because he's already there. El Olam, the God of the vanishing point, as far back as you can look, he's there. As far as you can go in the future, he's there. That's the victor I'm talking about tonight. Oh man, I better be careful. I'm gonna get excited. I want you to understand, even with Hagar of the Old Testament, we see it. In Genesis chapter 16, you know the story. The angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son. You'll call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thy affliction, and he'll be a wild man. By the way, every Arab is a descendant of Ishmael. So when you think about terrorists, not, not every Arab is a terrorist, but every terrorist seems to be Arab. Are you listening to me? Watch, he'll be a wild man. Think of your news today. His hand will be against every man, every man. Sunni and Shia, once they, get start, once they fight each other, once they stop fighting each other, they fight us. Listen, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren, the ones that are related to him. Do you know that, that Jews are related to them? They're related. They're half-brothers. Now watch. So she's been, watch what the word says. And she called the name of the Lord and spake to her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? We know this story. Hagar's an outcast. She's been ostracized because Sarah is pregnant, Abraham's wife. So he throws her out. She's been kicked out of Abraham's house. She's despised by Sarah. She's in the wilderness. She is poor. She's homeless. She's one meal and a wilderness fountain away from death. And it's the penetrating eyes of God that look down and see her. It sees all through the muck, all through the mire, all through the shame, all through the sham of her situation, and reaches into the wilderness to secure her and to save her. Come on. The word for the God that sees me is the word, is the word El Roy-i, the one, the God who sees through. But there's more than just seeing, for El Roy-i would come to be known in Old Testament as Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd, the one who watches over his flock. How do you think he does that? It's those penetrating eyes. Any device that's set against you, God sees right through it. Anything the enemy or any devil has any against you, God sees right through it. He sees every plot. He sees every intention. He sees every emotion. He sees straight through it. He knows it before they even do it. The penetrating eyes of God to watch over. Take a glimpse of Jesus today. The penetrating eyes of Jesus are protecting and watching over your family right now. Right now, you're worried. Some of you are worried about your kids that are away from God. Listen, the Bible says that there's a righteousness that's also passed down, not just generational sins. There's a righteousness. There's a cover. By one is the family made holy. God sees your children. Don't think there's not a protective covering on them. Don't think that when you pray, there's not a protective. God sees them. I promise you, when you get to heaven, you're going to find out every time God used, God did something to avert something that should have come. Secondly, Revelation chapter 1 tells us of the pursuing Christ. Listen. I love action movies. Chick flicks bore me to death. I, cannot go to, I can't go to movies with my wife because we can't agree on anything to see. As a matter of fact, late at night, if we both want to watch TV, which we don't do much, we go in separate rooms because she's going to watch a chick flick. Or she's going to watch somebody fixing up a house. I don't watch that because I actually do fix up houses. I don't want to see what I've already done. I want cars that are going as fast as they possibly can go. I want them to jump buildings. I want people to jump out at 96 stories up. I want to see parachutes. I want to see people just everywhere just doing things that are just so wild. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a junkie for it. And my wife is like, if it's a cartoon movie, she loves them. It has little dogs and something furry on it, and it's animated. That's right up her alley. I just want to bust the TV set. I'm just really <laughs> being honest with you. Revelation tells us of a pursuing Christ. Focus on that word with me for just a moment. Pursuing. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Notice the first part of that. His feet were like bronze. Feet of brass is another translation. It brings us back to the tabernacle in the wilderness. One of the most complete pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. You don't want to need to pass over it when you, when you read it. Every time you hear of sockets of silver, it talks about Jesus being the son of God. It's a symbol of him. Every time you talk about brass, it's talking about sin. Every time you see brass, notice there has some association with sin. It's a complete, one of the most complete pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. In the tabernacle, everything in the outer court, 
The court where dealt with sin was made of brass, everything that was there. Brazen, brass altar, Exodus 27, 2. Brazen, brass vessels, Exodus 27, 3. Brazen, brass great, grates, Exodus 27, 4. Brass poles to carry it, Exodus 27, 6. A brass laver, sockets of brass, tashes of brass, brass to hold the tent together. Why? Because this was the place where sin was judged. This was the outer court. It's all loaded with, with brass. And in Revelation 1, 15, it says his feet are brass because he's coming to tread down. He's coming to pursue sin. Every enemy living outside the gospel of heaven. Every foe outside of heaven. Every demon is going to be pursued. Every one of them is going to be cast down. He's coming to pursue. I want you to understand the imagery today. you got to pick me back up over there because I, I lost my charts. So every single one of them is, is going to be pursued by God. Come on. Man, I want you to understand. Man that fights against the son of man, Jesus coming to hunt them down. He's coming to take them out. And you don't want to be found in the outer court when he comes. You don't want to be found outside the gospel when he comes. You don't want to be found in your sin when he comes because those brass feet are going to tread it down. Those brass feet are going to hunt you down. Oh, come on, somebody say amen tonight. If you've gotten that back, if you've gotten it back, you can put the next one. Thank you. It says, in his right hand, he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its strength. Now, before I get to that, just listen to what it's saying. In his right hand held seven stars. Those seven stars are representative of the seven churches of Asia Minor. Those seven churches of Asia Minor are conditions people can find themselves in. I don't have enough time to tell you all about it today, but there are actual physical churches in the postal route that we now know as Western Turkey, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos. I get an acrostic for it. Every saved person truly seeks a perfected life. The, the start of every one of those words tells you about the different churches that are there. It's a condition. Not only is it a literal spot where those churches were that John was sending the letter to, but it was a condition of the church. You can be an on-fire Christian in an Ephesian church. You can be a Philadelphia Christian in an Ephesian church. It's also a condition of a church. Some churches are Philadelphia churches. Some churches are Laodicean churches. They're married to the world. Man, come on. In America, you can see how many Laodicean churches there are there. So he's coming. He has a candlestick because there's a candle there. And what he's doing, he's trimming the wick. When you trim the wick of a candle, it makes it grow grow brighter and it makes it glow brighter so he's trimming it. he's saying I have somewhat against you only two churches he doesn't censure Smyrna and Pergamos one's persecuted the other one's on fire I want you to understand all the other ones he says you better you better repent because I'm coming quickly he's judging the churches let me tell you something you want to be judged of God I want to be judged of God I want to know what I'm doing wrong I want to know how to get myself back right I want God to put his hand on me I want God to let me know man Mark you need to walk this way I want God to say, my child, you're going the wrong way. Come over here. I got somewhat against you. Come on. I still love you. I want you to grow brighter. I want you to burn up a little bit more. Come on. Burn for me. Give me some more passion. I want him to do that. He's pursuing. But understand, in Revelation, he pursues to kill with his word, the sword. But right now, that same sword, that same feet are pursuing mankind to bless him. It's a double-edged sword. Look, I used to go hunting small game up in Pennsylvania. And the first time I hunted, I hate to tell you this, I'm kind of, it's like a day of confession for, the, for me tonight. My friend got me to hunt. I was about 16 years old. And he had an old beagle. He, beagles are rabbit dogs. And he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand in a line. Gave me a 12 gauge, which is scary. So we're going to stand in a line. And our beagle, now this beagle was like 100 years old. I said, that beagle's not going to hunt. It can barely get up and eat. It can barely get up and eat its food. He said, oh, no. When he sees a rabbit, you'll know. I said, I, I've watched that beagle for months when I've come over your house. I've never seen him move from that spot. <laughs> they take the beagle out. They carry him to the woods. <laughs> Most pathetic thing I've ever seen in my life. They put him down. And he sits there. And I said, what are we doing? And he says, just wait. All of a sudden, that beagle starts smelling something. And he, he smells this thing, and he is, he takes off. I've never seen him walk, let alone run. And he's going, ow, 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 Don't ask me to do that again. And, uh, and he says, I said, what do we do now? He says, stay here. Just stay here. I said, for what? He said, he's going to run him back around. And he's going to run the rabbit. I said, he'll die before he gets that rabbit back around. He says, no, he'll run him back around. All of a sudden, here he comes. Okay, I'll do it. Everybody kills the rabbit. Look, the Holy Spirit is the hound of heaven. 
He is on the hunt tonight, and he wants to bring your unsaved loved one back around to Jesus. He's going out. What do you think you do when you pray for your unsaved loved one? You set the hound of heaven on him. The hound of heaven goes out, and he takes him right back around. Oh, come on. You ought to start claiming some unsaved lives tonight. Come on. You ought to start saying, I can claim Van Buren tonight. Hunt them down, God. Take them around. Pursue them. Bring them all the way around, God. Look, the sword of the Lord cuts both ways. It's two-edged. Right now, as Jesus pursues sinners, the word will cut to bless them. He'll actually cut himself with that sword to give that blood to them so they can come to righteousness. But one day, that same Christ is going to turn that sword to the other edge. And now the blood that's going to come out is not going to be his. It's going to be the blood of unrighteousness. The great winepress of the wrath of God, Revelation calls it. You with me tonight? If the sword of the word doesn't serve to save someone's life, it will condemn them in the afterlife. The sword will either, will either cut us or the sword will either save us. We have to decide that. But this pursuing Christ with the brazen feet is also a picture of the glorious groom that's pursuing his bride today, you and me. You know, I hear a lot of people, I was preaching in a church about Revelation. I go all over the country preaching about Revelation. And I'm preaching, and I got a heckler. A guy stood up and said, that's not right. I said, where did that, where did, who let him in here? His wife's giving him elbows. Shh, be quiet. I was preaching about pre-tribulation master. That's not right. I said, okay. I said, sir, I'll talk to you later. There's other people who want to hear, and we'll talk later. It's the right thing to do. So after, after the message, his wife comes up and she says, I am so sorry. I said, well, I understand. You probably should be. And she said, uh, he wrote a book on Revelation and nobody bought it. I said, well, understand why. <laughs> I was talking about the bride. And I was talking about how Jesus is coming back. You know, the whole, whole truth of Revelation is the phumos in the Greek. It's the phumos, the breathing hard. Did you ever get angry at your children and your nose flared and you started breathing hard? That's what this kind of wrath is. You and I got the wrath of God when Jesus was nailed to the cross. That was meant for you, and it was meant for me. We were meant to die and go to hell from our sins. But Jesus took the wrath of God. When he said, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He actually is taking all of our sin on himself. The corporate body of all man's sin. Can you imagine that? So much so that he wanted to pass the drink away. God, don't let me do this. He wanted to pass it away. All of it came on. That means you were judged on the cross through Christ. That's what makes you it always makes you righteous. Let me give you another example. If I had three styrofoam balls here tonight, and one of them was pure white, that would represent God. Please don't go out of here and say that Pastor Mark said God's a styrofoam ball. He's not. But it would represent God, pure white. You and I would be a styrofoam ball. We're pure black because we have sin. Jesus steps in the middle. He's black on this side, taking all of our sin, and he's white on this side so that when God looks at us through Christ, he only sees righteousness. Islam says that Il Alia, that uh, Allah, Il Alia, by the way, it's a moon god, one of, one of 400, says he's the same as God the Father. He is not the same as God the Father. He is a foreign god. He's the moon god. It's the only reason you see a crescent moon. If I take you to Israel, take you to the Dome of the Rock. In Arabic, on the top of the Dome of the Rock, it says, God has no son. I got news for Islam. God does have a son. And you can't get to heaven without him. No one will see the Father without Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, he's pursuing today. I'm telling you, he's coming back today. I want you to understand that pursuing Christ is a picture of a glorious groom. He's coming back for his church, his bride, without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for you and I. He's pursuing us right now. He's coming at us right now. He's wooing us right now. He's giving gifts to us right now. He gives us the earnest of the Holy Spirit. It means a wedding ring, the engagement ring. He's engaged to you. He's coming back for you. That's the Christ we're waiting for. Those seven stars and the seven churches of Asia Minor, the seven, seven phases of the church, the sevenfold conditions of Christians from someone who let their first love go away, the Ephesian Christian to a Thyatira Christian who has one foot in the church and another in the world, to a Philadelphia Christian living in the power and the zeal of the gospel, to a Laodicean Christian, lukewarm, who lost their decisiveness to follow wholeheartedly. Listen, but even to the backsliding Laodicean Christian, Jesus is pursuing them. Revelation 3, 19 and 20. Listen to what it says. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. 
He that sat on him was called faithful and true. It's the wrong one, but that's okay. In Revelation 3, 19 and 20, I think it's the one before that, if you can, if there is one before that. There you go. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come to him and dine with him and him with me. We can be thankful that Jesus still loves Laodicea. He's still knocking. In fact, he's been knocking on some hearts so long that his knuckles must be calloused. I think he's worn impressions on his knuckles on hearts' doors. How many times has God been knocking on our doors, pleading with us to open up to him? And the only response some men give him, some women give him to his knockings, they pull down the shades. They close the blinds. Isn't it time we get zealous and repent? He promises that if we'll simply open the door, he will come in. I was brought up a Roman Catholic. As a Roman Catholic, I, when I sinned, I had to go to a priest. I had to say my act of confession. I had to kneel down in, a, in, a, in this little booth, a light came on, told everybody else, there's somebody in the booth. And I would kneel down and say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been four weeks since my last confession. Here are my sins. He'd hear all my sins, and he'd give me penance to do. I always got the rosaries four times or five times. Everybody else got a Hail Mary. I got rosaries, which means I have ten Hail Marys and about 50 Our Fathers. So everybody else is doing their penance, and I'm still there like an hour later. So I got mad one day. Everybody has this long line. There's, there's a, the, the priest is in the booth, and he closes the door. There's a booth on this side and a booth on this side. When you go in, you kneel down, a red light comes on, so nobody else opens that door. I got mad that he gave me so much penance. So when, I, when the last person came on, I took a brick and I stuck it on that kneeler. That light stayed red for the longest time. I kept hearing the, the priest open that door and say, yes, son, yes, son, yes, son, yes, son. He finally came out and said, Carell, get back in here. We're all sinners. We all fall short. God chases us. Let me tell you something. Not too long ago, there was a book out called, several, several years ago, a popular Christian book said, The God Chasers. Look, we got it all wrong. We're not chasing God. He's chasing us. He's pursuing us. Right? He's pursuing some right now. Right as I'm talking here tonight, he's pursuing them. Come on, he's on the hunt for souls to bring inside his kingdom so he won't have to judge them one day outside of it. Revelation 19 recaptures the image of chapter 1. Revelation 19, now that next one, if you would give that to us. And I saw heaven open to behold a white horse, no donkey this time. He that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes, it's retelling re us what happened in chapter 1. His eyes were a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, diadema, many crowns. He's ruling, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The next one, please. And it goes on to say this. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Wait, how many of you have never ridden a horse? Raise your hand. Oh, I'm in Arkansas. Everybody rode, rides horses. What, what am I thinking? How many of you have ridden a horse? Oh, my goodness. Everybody in here has ridden a horse? How many have never ridden a horse? Just raise your hand. Look at that verse because you've got a horse coming. <laughs> the armies of heaven are you and I. Every single one of us are going to ride a horse. It says, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with it should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. Isaiah chapter, chapter 14, verse 20, verse 2. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me tell you something today. I want you to understand what we're talking about. So much for the image of Jesus be having blonde hair and blue eyes. I got news for you today. If we have a picture of Jesus that has blonde hair and blue eyes, you got a wrong image of Jesus. Even when he was here, he didn't have blue eyes, and he didn't have blonde hair. He was, a, he was an Israeli. He had dark hair. He had dark skin. He had dark eyes. You know who that picture is? Go home and Google Apollo. Uh, Google the God, the Greek God Apollo. He's going to look just like the Jesus that most people picture today. It's one of the reasons that Jews won't accept Christianity, because they say we have a Greek pagan God. Jesus was not blonde and long blonde hair and blue eyes. The Bible says in Isaiah, he had no form or comeliness that we want to be around him. It means he wasn't there very handsome. He was, but let me tell you something, something drew people to him. He had something deep inside him that went beyond physical looks. He had something deep inside him that was penetrating, that brought people onto him. That's the Christ, and the Christ that's coming back isn't even going to look like that. He's going to have hair that's white as wool. He's going to come back in the power of the majesty of the Godhead. He's going to come back for you and I. You are going to be absolutely flabbergasted when you see the Christ of Revelation. So much for the image of Jesus being meek and lowly and riding on a donkey. Or God being some old man with a gray beard. That's ridiculous. Michelangelo should have, they should have taken his paintbrush away from him. 
God's not an old man sitting up there with a gray beard. You know what the Bible says about God? He's a light that no man can approach. It says he sits on a throne in the mountains in the side of the north, which means there's topography in, in, in heaven. And the Bible says when he sits on his throne, the word for throne is iris in the Greek. You know what an iris is? It's the same thing that's in your eye. It pulsates. Boom, boom, boom. Myriads of angels are there around him, praising him. I want you to understand, if you think you're going to see God the Father, you're going to see the image. You're not going to see an image of a man. The Bible says gives him some images of men, so that it's called an anthropomorphism, so we can understand God. They talk about the, the eyes of God going to and fro, God the Father. They talk about him hiding you under the shadow of his wings. If he's a man, how does he have wings? It's just for you to understand it. But God the Father is a light that no man can approach, and he's pulsating. That image is pulsating. That was Lucifer's job. Lucifer was created with, a, with a, a vest of gems inside of him, nine of them, a type of breastplate. He was missing a whole row of gems. I may have even told you this before. He's missing a row of gems. That's a salvation, that's a salvation row. If you look in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, you'll find that he was on the mountain of God, the Bible says. The Bible says he's walking up and down on the stones of fire. God's throne is behind him. The myriad out of angels are out there. He's walking up and down the stones of fire. It says he has tabrets in his side. That means tambourines. He's a walking, talking light show. He's walking up and down on the stones of fire. His body is playing like an instrument. He's leading the choruses of heaven. He has these breasts. He has these crystalline stones. The Bible tells you what kind they are. All he has to do, take your crystal at home. Take your finger, wet it. Go around the window of your crystal. It plays a note. He's playing notes on his very body, and he's worshiping God. All the angels are following him. He's the son of the morning. Lucifer means son of the morning, son of the light. The light's passing through him. That pure light's coming out, and it's breaking into every color you can imagine. Heaven is just a glow with, with God and Lucifer who had a symbiotic relationship with God. And then Lucifer gets this bright thought that he wants to be like God because there's nothing else like him. So he starts to ascend the throne of God. And as he ascends the throne of God, the Bible says God takes a stone out of the midst of the fire and he creates hell. Hell was not created for you. It was created for the devil and his angels. It was created for Lucifer and his angels. There is no reason why anybody on this planet should be able to go to hell. Listen to me tonight. God's not an old man up there sitting someplace with hair that's really white. And that's not the image of God at all. We have no clue, very little clue of what's waiting for us. My whole desire tonight is to stir you to understand where your destiny is. You will never get revived unless you understand what you're revived to. You need to be revived to say, God, I am so ready. When I lay in a hospital room 10 years ago and the doctors came in and said to my wife, he's not going to make it through the night. I remember hearing the words. My wife and I were crying. She was crying. And I, I remember something coming over me and it just flooded me. And I, so I saw, I, although I felt very sorry for my family, I smiled. And Cheryl said to me, what are you smiling for? I said, I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him. Death is not the final end for us. Ecclesiastes says the day, of your, the day of your death is better than the day of your birth. We have no, no knowledge what we're going to be born into. Listen, it's going to be amazing for us. Now just listen to me for a moment. Read, put up first 2 Thessalonians, if you will, that next chart. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. The judge. To give relief to you who are afflicted, afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed, revelation, apocalypsis, from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, he will punish with an everlasting punishment those who have gone against him. You can't be an evil school shooter and not repent and think you're going to find a heaven someplace. It's not going to happen. That's not the Jesus of the gospel is being written of here. The very next verse says, when he shall come to be glorified. That's a prophetic passage, not talking about the meek and lowly Savior, but the one who's coming back as judge, jury, and executioner. It would be good for us to remember, for man to remember tonight, that the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. Jesus, the revealed Christ, has penetrating eyes pursuing feet of brass, 
Those eyes are not just to, to, to penetrate the wicked, but to see you through your problems and your darkness. Those feet are not just to hurt, hunt down the enemy and the wicked, but to run after his bride and protect her. And lastly, if you put up Revelation 116, next chart, please. Same verse, but look at the end of it. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. The last one I want to give you is the Jesus is praiseworthy. He's praiseworthy. You need to know it. The sun shining in its strength. The countenance of the sun. We've already seen his position and the clo his clothes are golden. His hair is like snow. His feet like brass pursuing. His eyes like fire piercing. And his voice like crashing waves. And his face countenance and powerful. And then this. His face is the sun. It's worthy of our praise. Most amazing feature is his face. Like the sun at noontime. You can't look at the sun less, less, much less at noontime. In Acts 9, Paul got a brief glimpse of the face and was struck blind for three days. Moses had to stand in the cleft of the rock and the cleft of the mountain just to see the backside of the Lord's head, his countenance. No wonder chapter 21 says the city of heaven has no need for the sun, no need for the moon to shine there. For the glory of God lightens it and the lamb is the light thereof. Where, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. He is praiseworthy. Let me tell you one of the reasons why Satan hates you so much. I just told you his job in heaven. You know, when he fell... God didn't use one of the angels to replace him. Usually when somebody leaves a job, you put somebody else in it. You know who took his job? Have any idea? You did. And so did I. When you come in here and praise, you are reflecting the light of God. You're allowing that light to shine through you. You're allowing the glory and majesty of God to shine through you. I may have done this before for you, but it bears repeating if you weren't here. Many times in my messages, I'll tell what happens at the end, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Every. That means that Adolf Hitler is going to be called up at the great white throne judgment. He's going to come and bow his knee and he's going to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. It means that, that Genghis Khan is going to come up and bow his knee and say, Jesus Christ is, is Lord. Osama bin Laden is going to come up and bow his knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Eli Amin is going to come up and bow his knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone that's made fun of you and doesn't want the gospel and ridicules you is going to come up and bow their knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And then I can't wait to see every single demon in hell come up and bow their knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And then Satan himself is going to come up from the bottom of his pit. He's going to bow his knee and he's going to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm telling you, Jesus is praiseworthy today. Jesus is praiseworthy tonight. His face is shining like the sun. He is worthy of all of our praise. Who can describe the glory of Jesus? Who can anyone, how can anyone describe it? The light of heaven is the face of Jesus. The joy of heaven is the presence of Jesus. The melody of heaven is the name of Jesus. The harmony of heaven is the work of Jesus. The employment of heaven is the service of Jesus. The duration of heaven is the eternity of Jesus. The fullness of heaven is Jesus himself. Jesus will be what makes heaven for me. I want to see him face to face. I want to see my Lord. That's what's going to make heaven for me. The great 19th century evangelist Charles Spurgeon would close almost every one of his meetings with these words. I would recommend you either believe God up to the hilt or else not believe it all. Believe this book of God, every single letter of it, or else reject it. There is no logical standing place between the two. Be satisfied with nothing less than a faith that swims in the deeps of divine revelation. A faith that paddles the edges of the water is poor faith at best. It is little better than a dry land faith, and it's good for nothing. Put that next one up if you would. Noah told his generation that it would soon rain, R-A-I-N, and they laughed at him and mocked him. We try to tell our generation that Jesus will soon rain, R-E-I-G-N, and they laugh at us and mock us. As in the days of Noah, you are living in the days of Noah. That last one, if you would, please. Jesus, born a baby, preached as a child, killed as a man, arose as a victor, is coming back as king. King of kings, Lord of lords. As I close tonight, let me be real honest with you. I don't have a profession in preaching. I had a man call me up that I led to the Lord years ago. He's made all the wrong decisions in life. And uh, he's married, has two children now, and, just has made, and he's 
bungled his life all the way down the line, hasn't gone to church in a long time, calls me up. He says, Pastor Mark, matter of fact, it's on my voicemail. I need to talk to you. This is Tommy. Call me back as soon as you can. He lives right around the corner from me. He calls me. I call him back. And I said, Tommy, what's the matter? He says, uh, I failed in another job. He says, I want, to sp- I want to sit down and talk with you. He says, and I want to talk about uh, going into the preaching profession. I said, why, Tommy? He said, well, no, I look at you. He says, and you seem to have everything. You have a big house. You have some nice cars. I said, Tommy, do you have any understanding of what you're saying? I said, I left a lucrative job, and they paid me $100 a, a week. I barely had gas. This isn't about money. You know, I'll be real honest with you. I love, your, I love this church. Pastor and this church have been good to me. I don't care if I get a cent. I could care less. I have never asked for money anywhere. You know why? Because the kingdom is not about money. I took, a, I took a pastor, I was a pastor down in Pensacola, Florida, and I, he took me out to dinner, and I didn't pull this on pastor yet, I'll have to do that, but I can't now. I said to the pastor, I was his evangelist for the week, I said to him, uh, the bill came, and I said, I want to pay it. He said, oh, no, 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 you can't. I said, listen, if you can answer a question, yes, one question I give you, yes, I'll let you pay it. He said, okay. I said, has an evangelist ever paid for your, for your meal? He said, no. I said, then I'm going to pay for it. This is not about taking money. This is about taking what the word says. My whole reason for being here today is you're the big thing God told me about that I had to do. I want to be able to spread this gospel. Your pastor's in the trenches. A pastor's in the trenches every week, every day. He brings up, he brings up message to you. And then he deals with, with all the things he has to deal with in helping and, and, giving, and giving counsel and nudging this way. He's got, a, he's got a crook that either will pull you in. And thank God if he's, if he's strong with you. If he's ever had to be strong with you, stay there. Take it. The Bible says whom God loves, he chastises. This man doesn't hate anyone. He loves you. It doesn't mean you're outside having a strong word at times. But let me just tell you this. The whole reason we do this, the reason why he and I have such a relationship, is because we know the same spirit. We know that the heaven's going to break open and that the king of kings is going to come. And let me tell you something sobering. Let me tell you something sobering. You're responsible for your own spirit. That's it. We, as pastors, are responsible for our spirits and all of yours. The Bible says it. It's an awesome responsibility. So why am I here tonight? I'm not here to embarrass anyone. I'm not here to do anything other than to get us all to be honest and say, man, I just need more of God. Come on, be honest with yourself. You you come to church. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Coming to church is saying is opening up. It's just opening up. You know, the best services you're ever going to have doesn't have anything to do with, with, the, with how fiery somebody preaches. It has to do with how much your emotion will come in and let God take care of it. So tonight I'm going to ask you just to stand with me for one, one moment. Would you do that? You know, I don't say this to a lot of congregations because I can't. I don't feel it. But I want to let you know I love you. I really do. I don't know most of you. I probably don't know 98% of you. But I love you. You're attentive. You're here. I feel your spirit. I feel you wanting more of God. You come back to church on Sunday night. How admirable. You bless your pastor. I've seen you do it. I've seen you esteem him, the position that's there. Can he make mistakes? You bet. Can I make mistakes? You bet. But let me tell you something. Those leaders that God gives you is for you to say, God, thank you. A pastor is a gift to a church. And I don't even know why I'm telling you this other than this. I want to bear my heart to you. I want to tell you, this is not just another place I come to and go to. Every place I go, I pray for everything I have to preach. The reason why I preached that message today is because God showed me that message. Do you think it wasn't a coincidence that you had those signs? Gary, Pastor Gary, you you sang the first song and had to do with Jesus coming back. Those things aren't coincidence. That's God lining it up. So don't miss it tonight. Bow your heads with me just for a moment. And let's be real honest tonight. If you feel like you failed him, or you feel you need him more tonight, come kneel at this altar. Come on, you feel like, man, and that's a hard thing to admit, isn't it? Man, I'm not everything I should be, God. I want to come up to this altar. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. All heaven's watching. Thank you. Thank you. The Holy Spirit hunts us down. Can't tell you how many times I had to go to an altar. Say, God, I'm sorry. Repenting is something we can do, not to some priest in a booth someplace, but in front of God Almighty. Man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for bringing your heart to God. Just take a spot right here. Come on, there's more of us tonight. 
Maybe you feel weak sometimes. Maybe it's not a sin. Maybe it's not a sin that's bothering you, some habitual sin. Maybe it's something that's just hindering your walk. Maybe it's a thought against the neighbor. Maybe it's something that you're, it's a feeling that you don't want to feel anymore. Somebody's hurt you and, and, you, and you're holding and you're carrying it on. Give it to God. Just give it to God. You're a step away from it. Come on. That's you tonight. I'm speaking to someone tonight. There's a man here tonight. You're holding a, and harboring something that's happened to you years ago. And every time the person's name comes up, something happens in your body. Let me tell you something. God wants to free you from that tonight. Now, don't get me wrong. There's people you need to stay away from in life. Some people make you miserable. You need to stay away from them. But you can't harbor anything in your heart. That's a bitterness that will grow and choke out everything that's good. So tonight, there's more of you. Come on. Come on up. Come on. There's more of you. Come on, let me just appeal to you today. You're hurting for your families. You're hurting for those unsaved loved ones. I said something about your family today. Come up and claim that statement. Come up and say, man, God, I'm standing in for my son. I'm standing in for my daughter. I'm standing in for my husband or for my wife. Come and do that tonight. Make your trip to church worth, worth it tonight. Jesus is coming back. Oh, man. One day he's going to split the eastern sky. The dead the trump of God will sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up forever in the Lord. Come on, there's more of you. Come on up tonight. I'm going to ask everyone to come up and even stand behind some of these. Come close. I heard pastors say you're a family. We're going to act like a family tonight. We're going to come up and we're going to encourage each other. We're going to pray one for another. I don't I can come pray for some of you. Why don't you just pray for somebody right in front of you right now? Why don't you just hold their hand and pray for them? Pray that God would touch them. Pray that God would do something in their life. Pray that God would give them that extra boost. Pray that they would have, a, they would have a, an eternal view, not just a world view, but an eternal view tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Oh, God, have your way tonight, oh, God. Jesus. Come, Jesus. Come on, there's more of you. Come on, don't stay in your seat. Come on. Come on up. Everybody here, move in some more. Come on. Let's come up. Let's just put ourselves in front of God tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Touch your God.